Thank you for that very kind introduction. Thank you for those kind words, and thanks to my good friend Lauren Craner and my fellow members of IRI's Board of Directors for their leadership of this great organization. I also want to thank the donors whose generous support has made this dinner and so much of IRI's work a great success. And finally, let me thank all of you, the staff and supporters of IRI, who are the indispensable heart of this institute's extraordinary work, the worldwide support for the infrastructure of democracy and free societies. It's my great honor tonight to present IRI's Freedom Award to a dear friend, a man for whom I have the deepest admiration, for whom I have learned more than I can ever repay, Secretary of State George Shultz. Last year, we changed the format for this dinner. We used to have the Freedom Award recipients give a speech, but last year, we threw out the speech and instead made two people work for their dinner. And I think all in attendance would agree that Henry Kissinger's conversation with Neil Ferguson was riveting proof of the new concept. So we're keeping that format tonight, and I'm fully confident that our 60th Secretary of State will once again meet the remarkably high standard of his predecessor. Joining Secretary Schultz on stage and guiding tonight's discussion will be Ambassador Richard Solomon, the President of the United States Institute of Peace. Ambassador Solomon's relationship with Secretary Schultz goes back to 1986, when he was Director of the Secretary's Policy Planning Staff at the State Department. Ambassador Solomon went on to run U.S. policy toward Asia under Secretary James Baker, and then to serve as Ambassador to the Philippines. For the past 17 years, he has helped to transform USIP into America's preeminent independent institution working for the prevention and peaceful resolution of conflict. Indeed, it's impossible to imagine that USIP would be to what it is today without Richard Solomon. It's equally impossible to imagine the world as it is today without the deep imprints made upon it by George Schultz. Last year's Freedom Award recipient had this to say about this year's honoree, quote, if I could pick any man for any job in this country, I would always start with George Schultz. Perhaps that's because Secretary Schultz has had most of those jobs already. <laughs> <coughs> U.S. Marine, economics professor, CEO, Secretary of Labor, Secretary of Treasury, and the longest serving Secretary of State since Dean Rusk. George Schultz is quite simply one of America's most consequential authors of world history. It is no coincidence that the Berlin Wall fell and communism collapsed in the years immediately following Secretary Schultz's long tenure. And they did so in large part because he mobilized the free world to match our desire for peace with the courage and strength to achieve it. It's also no coincidence that the number of countries classified as free or mostly free increased by about 50 percent during the 1980s and then expanded significantly thereafter. And this occurred in large part because Secretary Schultz proclaimed the moral and practical superiority of free institutions and worked for their triumph in every corner of the globe. Long before pundits were claiming to have discovered globalization, Secretary Schultz was explaining to Soviet leaders how the global integration of markets and commerce was leaving their markets behind. And long before the attacks of September 11, 2001, in 1984 to be precise, Secretary Schultz was warning of international terrorism, the global threat it posed to freedom, and the urgent need to organize our government to defeat this new danger. I've seen a lot of secretaries of state in my time, more than I care to admit publicly. I've seen masterful diplomatic tacticians and brilliant grand strategists, but precious few have embodied both virtues as fully and effectively as Secretary Schultz. And of the many glorious causes that he has advanced with his enormous talents, I believe the one where his impact has been the greatest, the one that endears him most to us at IRI, and the one that will ensure his name 
is forever etched in stone as one of America's greatest statesmen is the cause of human liberty, its defense, its sustainment, and its advancement. And one day, many years from now, when freedom has won its ultimate triumph over tyranny and darkness, historians of the future will remember George Shultz as one of the finest authors of that success. So it's my profound honor to present the 2010 IRI Freedom Award to my hero, my mentor, and my dear friend, Secretary George Shultz. Well, we're waiting for Dick Solomon to get up here. <laughs> Let me say that I tremendously admire Senator McCain and the IRA. Both Senator and the IRA have had the ability to have a sustained commitment to this cause of freedom. Lots of people sort of come and go. It's important that you stick at it. So it's been a long period, and it's been very successful. I remember vividly the Chile experience. I had been at the University of Chicago when we had a stream of Chilean bright people come, and we trained them in classical economics. Then when Pinochet became the president, whatever else. He, the Chilean economy was a total mess. And he sort of said, but does anybody know how to run an economy? And our Chicago guys put up their hands as we know. So a good free market economy got put into place in Chile. They became known as the Chicago boys. So they had the only good economy in Latin America during the 1980s. And so I become Secretary of State, and I'm watching Chile very carefully. The impact of open economics has uh, its relationship to the political side. Anyway, along about 1987 or so, I forget exactly, there was a clause in the Chilean Constitution that said there should be an election for president every 12 years or something like that. So Pinochet decided to have a vote. And the ballot would have only one person on him, him, so that would be no problem. So he puts this vote up. And we started to work at it. And the IRA was a presence. And we counseled the, had to work with the opposition, particularly as it became apparent that this was going to be a real election. And the problem was to keep them from falling for violence. It would be an instigation of violence. That would be an excuse to shut down the electoral process. I remember Castro tried to foment violence. He was sending arms. We found out about it. We intercepted them. And in the end, there was the vote, and more people voted against them than voted for him. So then Chile became an open political system as well as an open economic system. Just a week or so ago, the new president of Chile visited us at the Hoover Institution at Stanford, where I am. We had a nice chat with him. Terrific guy. He remembered all this background. And this is just an example of being at the right place at the right time on the part of IRA to counsel people who are struggling. And in this case, the main counsel was be ready, be careful, don't get drawn into violence, and make this thing go. 
So anyway, I can't say enough in my praise for what you're doing. And I can't say enough in my praise for Senator McCain. He is a patriot. He has worked for this country. He has fought for this country. He has shown what it takes to have, uh, have class under great pressure. And he, won, he ran a very honorable presidential campaign. I was proud of him all the way through. And now he's in the Senate. And once again, he's serving the people of Arizona, but he's also serving the people of the United States. And I might say more broadly, people who believe in freedom. So thank you, Senator McCain. So, Dick, you finally got up here, huh? <laughs> okay. It was intimidating, Mr. Secretary. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you don't look intimidating. <laughs> it was a real honor to have had uh, the opportunity to try to support you and President Reagan during really a remarkable period in history. We struggled on the policy planning staff to make good. Now I have an opportunity to find out what really was in your head or what you really thought uh, was going on. <laughs> but seriously, your remarkable career brackets from Secretary of Labor, Treasury to the Secretary of State, almost all the issues that are now roiling the world that are presenting our country and the international community with, uh, with real challenges. And from that perspective, I want to read a very brief excerpt from your a memoir of your time as Secretary of State entitled Turmoil and Triumph. When I started as Secretary of State, the world was in turmoil. And when I left office, the Cold War was over, and after a struggle lasting over four decades, the idea of free and open political and economic systems had triumphed. Now, a quarter of a century has passed since then, and uh, just as a way of uh, providing a couple of uh, uh, way signs to some of the issues we may try to cover in our, in our brief time. You used to comment with awe about the power, the innovativeness, the adaptability of our economy. And here we are today struggling not only to come out of the worst uh, recession from the Great Depression, but the world economy, that globalization that you saw emerging in the 80s uh, is under enormous strain. So. From the point of view of a Secretary of Labor, how do we get out of this situation? How do we have growth, particularly with, with jobs? Is there, as some people say, a Chinese model that has replaced all that was positive in our economy? Then there's democracy. It was spreading throughout the 1980s. Today we see in political systems around the world democracies that are certainly polarized, if not, not paralyzed. Nuclear weapons. Uh, during the Reagan administration, you and your team negotiated the most far-reaching arms control agreements. How many questions are you going to ask me anyway? <laughs> today, today, the nuclear issue is out of control. <laughs> and then, as the last point, the information revolution. We saw it as driving the world to this new era. Now we worry about uh, cyber terrorism and the insecurity of our, of our systems. So tell us why things seem to have come apart and where we should be headed. Well, first of all, I think the work for freedom never stops. In a sense, you never win. You have to keep fighting all the time. As has been said, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. It's one of these problems you have to work at and as I said earlier, one of the reasons why I think IRI has been so effective is that it has staying power. It keeps working at it all the time. And that's what we have to do in our country and everywhere. Have to realize that. As far as the economy is concerned and our ability to come back, come on, we've always come back. We've faced all kinds of problems in our history. We had World War II. People said, my God, we're hardly prepared. We can't do anything. And look what we did. Then we had the Cold War. And we had a concept. We had an idea. We held the Allies together. 
and eventually we prevailed. When President Reagan took over, you remember, Jimmy Carter's word was malaise, I think. We were down. We had inflation in the teens. Prime rate was in the 20s. The economy was going nowhere. The Soviets were marching in Afghanistan. All was lost. We we're ungovernable. What happened? Ronald Reagan took over with a strategy. An economic strategy, a political strategy with respect to the Soviet Union. It was a good strategy. We kept at it. By the time Ronald Reagan left over office, the Cold War was all over but the shouting, and our economy was good and more important in a way. We stood tall. People respected us. So you can turn these things around. And we have always done that in the United States, and I think we can. Now here's the problem with our economy. I, I had a great friend here, I miss him, Senator Pat Moynihan. He was in the White House in the Nixon administration and get, became a good friend. He used to say, you're entitled to your opinion, but you're not entitled to your facts. So what are the ideas in economics that have factual support? Number one, incentives matter. People respond to incentives and disincentives. Tax rates are an important element in that. Number two, behavior is affected by things that are permanent Temporary little fixes don't affect people's basic effect behavior. They may move activity from here to there, but they don't have any basic effect. Permanent things are what matters. And things you can count on. Uncertainty is your enemy. Number three, things work best when you have skin in the game, when people have a stake. When you have no stake, you don't pay much attention, but when you have a personal stake, don't you? If your money's there, you pay attention more than if you do. That's obvious. And number four, you need to have a lawful society that's predictable. And you're not subject to a lot of arbitrary decisions by people who are going to do this, going to do that, and so on. We have departed from those principles. I'm sorry to say I believe we departed from them in Republican times. And what we got was the mess we're in. And as far as I can see, we have on our hands right now an anti-growth policy. We've created, we've maximized uncertainty. We have tax rates going up every time a bill is passed in the Congress. There are little bits and pieces of taxes in there. And what's going to happen with these, uh, these about to expire tax reductions? The Congress doesn't have the ability, apparently, to stand up to it. They couldn't stand up to the estate tax, so there was huge uncertainty about what's going to happen to tax rates. So no wonder the economy is in the doldrums. And we have these actions taken to bail out this company and not that company and so on. Nobody knows what the strategy is. And people say they need more power. I say they need less power. We want things to go according to the rule of law, not human whim. So let's get back to these basics. And our economy will respond. It always has. It will. Is that all? <laughs> That's the bundle, Dick. Okay. <laughs> Since uh, you left office, you working with uh, Secretary Kissinger, uh, former Secretary of Defense Bill Perry and former Senator Sam Nunn have put down a marker that it's important to work to a non-nuclear weapons world. And uh, a lot of folks who have seen you and uh, the others that you're working with as pretty hard-nosed people who helped get us through the Cold War say, is, is it really possible to have a world without nuclear weapons? Where do you see your zero nuclear weapons world effort headed? Well, in many ways more important than what the four people you mentioned think. That's what Ronald Reagan thought very profoundly. That's what John F. Kennedy thought very clearly. 
Basically, that's what President Eisenhower thought. And in the current scene, that's what Senator John McCain thinks. As he put it, Ronald Reagan had a dream of a world free of nuclear weapons, and I share that dream. President Obama has pushed this cause. Now, where are we at this point? In some ways, we have won the battle of rhetoric. At a UN Security Council meeting, a resolution was adopted unanimously, and the people around the table, including all the nuclear states, agreed. But there's a reality there. And in an interesting way, President Sarkozy of France around that table said, yes, we all agree this is a great objective, but what are we going to do about Iran? If we can't do something about Iran, where are we? If we can't do something about a tin pat country like North Korea, what's going on here? So I think we have to face these realities and um, confront the fact that this we can't tolerate a nuclear Iran, nuclear weapons Iran, and we've got to come to grips with North Korea. But of course, there are many other things that can do, need to get done. And uh, we continue to work at this problem by, um, we have a little film that was made by the Nuclear Threat Initiative, Sam Nunn's group, that we all took part in. We show and answer questions and so on around the world and around the country. We have an important conference coming up at the Hoover Institution on deterrence. In some ways, the nuclear, nuclear has stolen that word. People think only nuclear deterrence is deterrence. That's not the case at all. If you have no nuclear weapons, there's plenty of deterrence in the picture. And somehow you have to ask yourself, what did nuclear weapons deter, really? They didn't deter the Soviets from going into Hungary, from going into Czechoslovakia, from going into Poland, from creating the conditions that caused the Berlin airlift, the Berlin Wall, from going into Afghanistan. Some somebody said, well, they deterred the use of nuclear weapons. Well, if that's all they deterred, we can do it better by not having any. Because if a nuclear weapon goes off somewhere, and obviously there are terrorist groups that are trying to get one, not to deter anything, to use it. Everybody will say, as Henry Kissinger says in this film, if that happens, everyone will say, why don't we do something about it? And we think we should try to do something about it before it happens. So we're working at it. And I'm proud to be working with Senator McCain on this issue. And I think it's like everything else. If it doesn't happen like that, you have to keep working at it, and we have to get at this Iran problem and the North Korea problem and turn some people around. But that's the job. Keep working at it. Everyone would like to see the international community come together, the UN Security Council at least, to uh, confront this issue. But it seems to me that uh, collective efforts uh, to counter the proliferation pattern as we've seen at North Korea, Pakistan, Iran, uh, may not be up to the task. Three times in the 20th century, the United States has taken the lead in trying to stabilize the world, deal with fundamental threats to our security. Uh, do you think this country could undertake uh, the kind of unilateral action that ultimately might be required to get the proliferation problem under control, or is that beyond the capacity of our political system or the international system to support? Well, the international system doesn't work very well. It's not decisive, has no teeth. And I mean, the UN Security Council passes a resolution, for example, after the last Lebanon war, that Hezbollah should not be rearmed. What's happened? They're completely rearmed. Nobody even raises a muscle about it. Now, there's an interesting and difficult problem that we face. It's exemplified by the Hezbollah case. Hezbollah has put all of these weapons around schools and hospitals and mosques and civilian occupations. So if they fire at you from there and you fire back, 
or if you fire in advance, you're bound to cause collateral damage. And that's not acceptable. So somehow our values have been turned against us in a kind of asymmetrical way. And our enemies use our values to put us at a disadvantage. That's a, a genuine problem, and we feel it in Afghanistan, I believe, this asymmetrical problem. And it's a problem in our international institutions. We design an institution to create conditions of peace, and all of a sudden there seems to be the notion that you can't do anything unless the UN Security Council approves it. Well, I guess we can't quite accept that if the UN Security Council doesn't have the capability to step up. It's a problem and we have to work our way through it and it's going to take a lot of tough-minded kind of Reagan-esque type people or John McCain type people who stand up to these things. So it's hard. We're seeing that uh, dilemma as we debate how to deal with the situation uh, in Afghanistan. And as you know, the president has said he wants to start looking at uh, withdrawal July of, of next year. You're out of your mind. <laughs> how can you say, I'm going to war, and if I haven't won by six or nine months from now, I'm leaving? I'm a Marine. Come on. <laughs> Give me a break. Let me go to the, uh, <laughs> the issue of trying to build public support in this country, and that and gets to the, the, the strong partisanship, the, the polarization that we see, not only in our politics, but elsewhere. How do you sense that we can uh, move to a period where there is less, less polarization? What, what might be done to uh, move to a period where we're able to get more bipartisan consensus? I wish I could give you a quick answer to that. I don't know, but I can tell you what we're doing in California. We have, with the support of Arnold Schwarzenegger, had an initiative that has passed that's changed the way the districts are drawn for electing people to the state assembly and senate. And on the ballot this November, we have a similar initiative affecting the way congressional districts are drawn. The idea being, as Arnold has put it, let's have the voters pick their politicians instead of the politicians picking their voters. And then we have, and I have in a sense conceptually, I have problems with this, but as a practical matter, I'm for it, an open primary. And the idea is to rearrange the system so that people running for office have to appeal to a broader public than just the extremes of their party. And I think that will produce people in office with a different attitude, more willing to work problems. Not, and compromise is not necessarily the right word. It's solving problems that um, I would like to see. And I hope that helps us in California. It's one of the legacies that Arnold will leave to his successors. And maybe something like that will work, but I have a tremendous respect for our system. And I've been gone from Washington now for over two decades, so I don't know the people here. I know a few. And those that I know are terrific people. And when I was in office here, and I worked with senators from both sides and members of the House. A lot of terrific people. And one of the things that happened to me that I'm most proud of is that the day before I left office, the Senate of the United States had a luncheon for me. It was organized by Dick Lugar and Ted Kennedy. And Bob Dole and George Mitchell chaired it. And most of the senators present were around that came. And they said, thanks for all the consultation and listening. And I said, thanks for all the support and help. It was kind of a mutual thank you session. They gave me a little award. It's the most prized award I have. But oh, for me, what it says is 
that if you're working for things that are clearly in the interest of your country and you go about it in a um, consultative way with people, you put the problem first, then maybe you can get somewhere. When you were uh, Secretary of State, one of the developments that just was emerging in the mid-80s was what you refer to as the information revolution. And indeed, uh, the internet, cell phones, all the things that uh, we live with now fully developed day, day by day have truly had a transformative effect on the way the world works. But also we came to see that the bad guys learned to use these technologies. The internet was a vehicle by Al-Qaeda and others to recruit, to raise money, to uh, try to coordinate actions. Uh, we're now worried about uh, cyber warfare, uh, malware, infections of our computer systems that could uh, bring down entire systems, uh, in, whether it's our electrical system or our financial system. On balance, how do you see the information revolution? Is it, it's still as transformative, but is it getting out of control? Is the, the genie out of the bottle? Well, first of all, let me remember, and you, when in the policy planning staff, you and I worked very closely on this. Remember that in our dealings with the Soviets, I remember Shevardnadze, the Soviet foreign minister, saying to me one day when we were, we kept drumming away on these human rights issues, and he said to me, George, someday we might do something about these things, but not to please you. Only if it's in our interest. And I thought about that. And you know, I talked about that. And we worked out a statement that I wrote out and I read out very carefully that basically said, we're moving into a new era. It's the information age. And any society that's closed and compartmented is going to get left behind. So you have to open up in your interest, not in our, in your interest. And that means allowing people more freedom. And Gorbachev told me that that statement got read to the Politburo, it had an impact. And in effect, the Soviet Union did open up. And look at the exodus of Soviet Jews, one of the great things that we work for. And sometimes people ask me about the thing in when I was in office that I get the most satisfaction from. It always has a human face. And I think the high point of my time in office was one day, I'm sitting in my office at the State Department I'm told there's a phone call coming through. Phone rings, I answer the phone. And this little voice on the other end of the phone says, this is Eden Udell. I'm in Jerusalem. I'm home. I had worked on her case in the Soviet Union. I thought, I don't know, can we ever get anywhere? And there she is, she's in Jerusalem. So whether I had any impact or not, I don't know, but one human being was better off. That's the way you have to measure these things. Now, of course, there's a downside, as you pointed out. But I think we can be alert to these things. We can defend ourselves. But every time our adversaries use these means, if we're smart about it and tough-minded enough about it, we know what they're saying. So once again, we don't want to put too many handcuffs on ourselves in being able to listen in to what they're talking about. Because intelligence about what they want to do is essential. Because, you know, we can't wait around for them to do something that has a huge effect on us and then try to enforce the law. We've got to find out what they're trying to do and then prevent it. Finally, let me... I made uh, a speech yeah. like that in 1984, as I think Senator McCain mentioned. And most people around didn't like it. Fortunately for me, there was one person in the administration who did. <laughs> His name was Ronald Reagan. So that, you've got to have one guy on your side. That's the guy to have on your side. 
Finally, let me make an observation about uh, your tenure as Secretary of State that I, I personally experienced, and that was, unlike many secretaries who choose to run the department, Ruse, to run foreign policy with a very small group up there on the seventh floor, your tenure was distinguished by the fact that you really drew on the talent in, in that building. Uh, and now today we have a remarkable uh, experience of a Secretary of Defense saying we've got to get diplomacy out in front again. We need to put more money into an under-resourced State Department. And we all know that uh, during the Iraq operation it was really run out of the Pentagon and the State Department really was not uh, organized and involved in a very active way uh, in dealing with that situation. Uh, what do you think needs to be done now to uh, produce a more vigorous State Department uh, to get the dip diplomats out in front and to uh, create the whole of government enterprise that is now talked about in which uh, we're not just always leading with the military but with uh, our civilian capacities as well? Well, first of all, in the Iraq example you gave, the Pentagon would have done well to listen to a senator who told them that they weren't putting enough resources in there in the beginning. <coughs> he turned out to be right. I wonder who that senator was. I. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously you have to have a Department of State that's well-resourced and has high-quality people in it that can go out and do things. And I think, as a general thing, I think we have a kind of constitutional crisis confronting us in the way our government works. Here's the way it seems to me the Constitution says it should work. Somebody gets elected president. There are various departments and agencies that have been created properly by votes of the Congress and signed by the President. Those are the agencies through which the government, the executive branch, is supposed to run things. Those agencies are populated at the top by people appointed by the President and then confirmed by the Senate. Those people can be called to testify. They're accountable. So that's the official, accountable way the government is supposed to work. What has happened is that the government is working in an entirely different way. More and more people are being appointed to the White House. This is, it's, it reached a kind of a zenith in this administration, but it's been growing for a long time. Czars of one kind or another are appointed in the White House, and they're supposed to run this, and they're supposed to run that, and the other thing. Next thing you know, the cabinet are sort of, sort of reporting to those people. That makes those jobs less attractive. In the meantime, we've developed a process of getting people in these jobs that's terrible. You, you say, yes, I'm glad to be assistant secretary of something or other. Then you go through an insulting process. It takes a long time. Then you get nominated, more stuff. Then you get voted out of committee, you hope. And then any senator can put a hold on you for any reason, not having necessarily anything to do with you at all. So you may wait around for months after you've said that you're ready to go before you serve. In the meantime, your life has been shattered. So it's not attractive. You remember Paul Nitze? Probably a lot of you remember Paul. He was a wonderful civil servant or servant and, and um, a person who made a lot of difference. In his autobiography, he tells a wonderful story about how he came to work for the government. He was working for Dylan Reed. And his senior partner had been asked by Franklin Roosevelt to come into the White House, as Roosevelt saw war problems looming, Jim Forrestal. So Paul says he's in Texas working some deal, and he gets a cable from Forrestal saying, I need you here at 10 o'clock Monday morning. So he shows up. 
And Forrestal says to him, well, Paul, I have to get to work right away. I've got lots to do. This is my desk. There's a desk for you. We have a wonderful young lady out there that will help us. I've rented a house in Georgetown. There's a room there for you. I have no way to pay you, so you'll have to stay on the Dylan Reed payroll, but get to work. So he says, in this entirely illegitimate way, I started my career in the federal government. And what a distinguished career. Now, I'm not recommending that that's the way people should be. <laughs> Obviously, you need to do some vetting. It can be done very easily through FBI checks and IRS checks and a little checking. But I think we have to get back to the notion that we assume that they're honorable people and they want to serve honorably. And if they really have some bad stuff, they better watch out. It's going to, they'd be better off not to get involved. But get these slots filled and let people work. You have to ask yourself today, with the process that has been put in place, could we attract Paul Nitze to come and work? We have big problems. We need the Paul Nitzis of this world in government. So we have to create a system where they can work. And the present system of White House czars has even got to the point where if there's somebody you know can't get confirmed, you wait until you can make a recess appointment or something and put them in there. This is totally outside the bounds of what I would consider constitutional government. So we're way off track, and we've got to get back on track. Mr. Secretary, I think I can say for everyone in this room that one of the great things about our society is that public servants like yourself who have made such enormous contributions continue to do so. And uh, the opportunity to share with you some perspectives on this remarkable period of your formal service, but to see how much you're doing since leaving office is something we deeply appreciate. Thank you, everybody.